a lot of people really underestimate. And I want to focus on uh, for the end of 1 Samuel and the, the beginning of 2 Samuel. It's one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture because you see what David does right before he becomes king. And there's actually a period where it says uh, David thought to himself, right? So up until this point, like this is after he slays Goliath. This is after, you know, he becomes this great warrior and they're singing songs about, you know, Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his tens of thousands. Um, but then there, there's a period of time, man, where Saul is pursuing David to try and kill him. And uh, out of fear, David thinks a lot to himself. And so uh, eventually what ends up happening is David joins the Philistines, which is the enemy, right? Then he has like 600 men with him. They all end up in this cave because the Philistines are like, hey, you can't fight with us because we're afraid that you're going to turn on us during battle. So you need to get out. Even though you've been with us for a year, you need to go, right? So David uh, takes all of his men 600 of them to a cave. And then the Amalekites end up destroying the hometown of all of David's men. So they, they kill their sons and their brothers and uncles. And then they take their wives and daughters as slaves and they burn down the whole town. And it actually says it got to a point where uh, the men were so upset with David. And they're like, hey, this is not the man of God that we know that we're actually going to stone him, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to stone him. And they wept and told them that their legs gave out, according to Scripture. So uh, then what's really interesting, it's one of my favorite lines in all of Scripture. It says, then David finally seeks out to the Lord. Then David finally inquired of the Lord. And then it's, and then and then you see things go up again, right? Mm -hmm. And then David, hey, should I pursue these people? And God's like, yes, pursue them. I will deliver them into your hands even though their army size is like five times, right? So it, what's really interesting is the very next chapter after it says David inquired the Lord, finally, uh, David actually becomes king, right? That's how actually 2 Samuel begins, right? It says David named king of the tribe of Judah. So the reason why I, I bring that up is because um, almost every single one of us, myself included, when it comes to the topic of money, we don't inquire of the Lord. We actually think to ourselves, right? We always think to ourselves. It's why we watch books. We read, you know, I'm sorry. We watch videos. We read books. We hire financial planners because we want to find the most tactical, logical, smart way for us to build and increase our bank account. Um, and, you know, I grew up in a way where my, my perspective on money was a very interesting one because I grew up a pastor's kid. We grew up really poor. Um, you know, Sam and I were immigrants to this country from South Korea. Our very first apartment, like you turn the light switch on and the cockroaches go to the outsides of the room, right? I, I loved going to school because it meant I got a meal, right? It meant I got fed. Huh. Um, so it was really interesting because my dad and my mom and every single pastor that I met, like they always said, oh, like money is the root of all evil. We don't love money. Like money is horrible. Money is bad. But then every Sunday morning without fail, they would ask for money. And if there was ever a big project in the church, like we needed a new parking lot or we ended up new, you know, we need a new roof, uh, you know, pastors would almost guilt trip people into giving money. Right. So I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people here watching um, 38 of us. Right. We all go to church or we have some level of faith orientation. I mean, it's day three for crying out loud. If you don't have some level of faith orientation, then you're probably not here, right? Uh, and, and we would probably gone to church and almost guaranteed like they're asking for money, whether it's just, hey, like your typical tithes and offerings, right? Or, hey, we have this big project and we have all these things. And, and it's amazing is because uh, whenever we need something done, uh, we ask God for money, right? And and the reason being is because I, I think with us Christians, uh, we have such a worldview and not an eternal view that we have handicapped ourselves and we've handicapped the abilities of God to think that things can only happen through money. Uh, and as a, as, a, as a man that owns eight, nine figure companies in my portfolio and does really well for himself, I can assure you that that's not the case, right? I can, I, I can absolutely guarantee you that that is not the case. That is not the way God works. In fact, if you look at scripture, and anytime you see God rewarding anybody, whether it's Joseph, whether it's Daniel, whether it's 
whatever. It, it usually isn't through money. It's actually through authority and through influence. Now, the money comes after that, uh-huh. right? But if you look at people like Joseph, if you look at people like Daniel, if you look at people who dedicated obedient to the Lord, it was never money. It was always influence and authority. And, and resources came as a, as a way because the opportunities were given to those individuals. 